We're going to talk tonight about launching a counterattack. What do you do when you realize there's incoming fire? Have you ever been in a place and you realize, ooh, this is the attack? So let's read Psalm 57, the first three verses. David writes, be gracious to me, O God, be gracious to me. For my soul takes refuge in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until destruction passes by. I will cry to God most high, to God who accomplishes all things for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He who he reproaches him and tramples me. What do you do when you realize there's incoming fire? The first thing is you hold steady. And you realize, I've had a couple of people say to me, well, that was an attack I just didn't see coming. You have, how many can relate to that? Maybe not this week or the week before, but at some point, that was an attack I just didn't see coming. Yeah. First thing you realize is that the attack did not come from God. Yeah. I didn't give you the scripture. But we fly over to John 10.10 10 for somebody that might not know the scripture. John 10.10 10 is like the continental divide in the Bible. If you know the continental divide, if you're in the middle of the Rockies, you can be just 10 feet up, away from another person, but a raindrop, and this is the highest mountain in the Rockies, and the peak goes like this. A raindrop falling on this side will get into a creek that goes to the Pacific, but on the other side will go to the Mississippi, right? That's the continental divide. Yeah. Well, this is the continental divide between good and evil. Jesus, your good shepherd, said, the thief, the devil, comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. So that is the great continental divide. If it steals, kills, or destroys, it didn't come from God. Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift comes from God. There's one other scripture I'd like to go to, just in case you're not aware or familiar with this, Acts 10.38. You need to know that all sickness comes from Satan. There's not a scripture in the Bible that says that sickness comes from God. Acts 10.38, Jesus, or Peter is preaching. He said, you know of Jesus of Nazareth. How God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. And how he went about doing good and healing. Pause. Is healing somebody doing good? Yeah. Then making somebody sick would be doing bad. Right? Okay? If you made your kids sick, they'd put you in jail, right? God wouldn't do that to his kids. You know Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. And how he went about doing good and healing who? Oh. All who were what? Oppressed by the devil. Who does the oppression of sickness? The devil. The devil. If you real clear on that, when an attack comes, you don't say, wow, I wonder if this was God or the devil. It was not God. It was the devil. Okay? Okay, now let's go back to Psalm 57. What do you do when an attack comes? One of the first things you do is you have to be absolutely unshakable in the fact that the Lord is the best, most committed friend you'll ever have. And sometimes when people disappoint us, it's very difficult. You ever been disappointed by somebody who thought really believed in you and then you goofed up and you found out they didn't believe in you all that much at all? The, the one, that isn't a bad thing to find out, and I'll tell you why. The Lord is absolutely totally committed to you for life. And in the middle of a storm, when an attack comes, you remember that you died into the presence of, of your most loyal friend. Even when our stock seems to have plummeted with ourselves and almost every friend we have, if our weird mind is weary, and where our emotions are battered, we still take refuge in his unfailing love. Look at what David writes, Psalm 57, 1. He says, be gracious to me, O God, be gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge in you. What does that mean? I'll find safety, emotional and physical, in the bunker of your presence. When you go back to God, maybe nobody else has ever messed up. Mm -hmm. just kind of like, oh, how can I have said that? All right, um, and he just like, oh, man, let's get this. Let's do something. And Jesus is just so gracious. So even in the midst of the worst attack, you know that you have a bunker, a place to find refuge, and that is in his presence. He's always on your side. So, and then the other thing I wanted you to notice, and how long do you take refuge there? He says, in the shadow of your wings, I'll take refuge. Until what? Destruction passes by. Question, does destruction pass? When you're in right in the middle of a surprise attack, you feel like it's forever. You think, okay, this is the end of all. I want to tell you something. You can hold steady until destruction passes. Everybody say that. Destruction passes. Destruction passes. Hallelujah. So number one, you hold steady and you stay calm. 
The one thing you don't want to do when something kind of blindsides you is overcorrect. If you're driving a car, the worst thing you can ever do when you realize your office is overcorrect. Amen. You just hold steady and say, Lord, I know you're going to get me through this. Now look at verse 2. David said, I will cry to God most high, to God who accomplishes all things. Everybody say all things. All things. All things for him. Did, did God accomplish that much for David? Did he choose him over his seven younger bro or older <coughs> brothers, giving strategy against Goliath and helped him dodge all these spears? Yeah, I mean, he, he just did. God is to be our perfect everything. There's not any part of our lives that God doesn't want to take care of. And when, the, when an attack comes, you just dive into God and say, okay, I don't know how you're going to get me through this, but I know we will get to the other yeah. side when we'll be, in, we'll be in victory. How many things does God accomplish for you? All things. So the first thing you do is you hold steady. You, you find refuge under the shadow of his wings. And the second thing is you call. Look at what verse 2 says. I will cry to God most high. You call on him. And here's our danger. The natural inclination is to say, how could you let this happen? But we remember, number one, he doesn't let this happen. Yeah. If he'd had his way, he would have said no to the devil and we'd have been home free, you know? Yeah. That would, so God is the one who's on your side, but just stay clear about that. And, and number two, you have to, instead of saying, how could you let this happen? When you call upon the Lord, call upon him with affection and confidence and trust. I was so glad you sang trust in Jesus. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. How many of you grew up singing that song? I love that song. You never trust him too much. And so it, when, when attack comes, you hold steady. You call on him with affection and say, Lord, you've always been there. And the third thing you do is you realize that the same rock that has answered prayer after prayer after prayer, the one who sought to track you down. How many of you know you didn't track him down? He tracked you down. Amen? The one who tracked you down and answered your prayers is ready to send loving kindness and truth from heaven. He says he will send from heaven and save me. He's on call. Can you imagine? Sometimes you'll hear little beepers going off in here. The guys on rescue squad, that they, they hear the buggers go, and they, ah, they were on call, and they got to go help somebody. Can you imagine God wears a, but a beeper and does it? He's on call. So even when the devil says, all is lost, and this, I got a surprise attack, and you do have somebody that is ready. The, not, the other thing you do is you realize that the same rock that has seen you through so many trials, you never change your confession in the middle of a trial. And I'm going to talk to you about this tonight for a little bit because some of us have been confessing the word of God for a number of years. How many of you have known about the word of faith for at least five years? I mean, you know that when you speak, God answers. Yeah. The enemy really, really wants you to get tired of saying, he always leads me to this triumph in Christ. But how many know that scripture? Yes. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 says, Thanks be to God. I might be chapter or verse 14. I get the verse here. I can find the chapter. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 says, But thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumph in Christ. Now, here's what happens when you get weary spiritually. You think, man, I've been saying that for a long time. Amen? But what I was thinking about during worship when, she, when John, the bat, or, or John the Beloved saw Jesus in the book of Revelation, what was coming out of his mouth? Anybody read Revelation chapter 1? There was something coming out of his mouth. What was it? A sword. Thank you. And what was that sword? Not a physical sword. It's the word of God. In eternity, Jesus Christ would be speaking the word of God. There's never a time when you can say, well, I've confessed that. I've known that since I was a kid. Let's look at Hebrews 10.23. When you get in an attack... You don't feel like confessing the word of God. You feel like saying, oh, poor, poor, poor me. Yes? But that's when you just say, I don't care how it looks. That's what it's, read it with me, would you? Let us hold fast the confession of our, oh, come on, help me. I'm not sure all by myself. Help me. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. He is faithful on the days when everything is going 100% right, and he's faithful on the days when you got blindsided with something you weren't expecting. I'm yeah. just telling you. And sometimes the problem is we feel like we must have outgrown some of these faith scriptures by now. Let me give you an example. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. I know Nathan knew that when he was less than three years old because he learned to read. On, I told you the story before. He learned to read. I got this wallpaper sample book. Never heard the story. And they gave him a week free, which was within our budget. And 
<laughs> Seriously, he <coughs> does it was your creativity. But I wrote these most important scriptures, and so he'd pretend to read them. Well, I knew he'd say, "Which one is this one, Mom?" And I'd say, "That's that's the no fear." So he'd read it to me. Well, of course, at first he wasn't reading, and then all of a sudden it started clicking, and he was reading. Long story short, he'd say, "God has not given me a spirit of fear, but power, of love, and a sound mind." With his own boy voice. Well, that's cool. Now, here's the danger. The, the world has a saying that's really true. Familiarity breeds contempt. Yeah. If you ever get so familiar with your mates that you no longer appreciate their marvelous qualities, big danger. You can never let that happen. Yeah. Same with the Word, same with the Lord. We need to love that scripture as much today. You see, Jesus was speaking the Word in heaven. Read Revelation 1. Where was speaking the Word in heaven? The Word is eternal. The Word is life. The Word is truth. It never, ever changes. So what I'm convinced trying to encourage you to do is when a trial comes, number one, hold steady. Number two, call on God with affection and confidence. Amen. He's on call. Knowing that Ed, that trial did not come from him. Every side say the trial did not come from him. And then realize that the same rock, the same word that's brought you this far and saved you from hell and brought you this far is still going to get you through this. You, know, you may not be able to know how or see how, but it's still going to bring you through in victory. I want to look at a couple of other scriptures. So familiar. Philippians 4.19. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And we know that this was written to a group of givers. He commends them for a few first verses of this chapter for their giving and he thanks them. But God said, if you're part of my gospel plan, my kingdom program, then be assured that I will meet your needs. Now, if not careful, we get way you just have to stop and think that through. Because I'll tell you the truth. We have declared war without meaning to in outreaches. Us ministry, missions program. And when that happens, you better be willing to stand your ground. Okay? And sometimes this, the church finances will still take a big whoop. And there, and y'all are so faithful, and I thank you. I commend you. I thank you. Oh, stand with me, because I had to go right back to this verse yeah. that I thought I knew as well as, you know, better than I know my name, and say, now God, I thank you that you're still faithful to me. Yeah. And that you do supply, no matter how many outreaches you call us to, you do supply our needs according to your riches. Amen. Look at Jude 24. This is a wonderful verse when you feel like you're caving in. Read it with me. Now to him who is able to keep you from the stomach and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless is great joy. That, is, that verse is enough. You can preach a whole sermon from that verse. What if you made a confession out of this? Lord, I thank you. You're able to keep me from falling. King James is falling. You are going to keep me from falling, even though I feel like I'm falling apart right now. You're able to keep me from falling to make me stand in the presence of your glory without shame. Without shame. Isn't that good? Okay. So I'm going to hurry because I'm going to go to uh, Nehemiah in a minute. But are you following here? When you get in a trial, the very last thing you want to do is call on God with affection and then confess his word. Do you know what you got to do? you got to just get real with yourself and say, this attack didn't come from God. Okay. He's the one that's brought me this far, and it's his word that will bring me through. And Jude 20 says, I am his beloved, and I build up myself on his most holy faith. Do we have that? It says, you beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying with the Spirit. Make a confession out of it. Say, Lord, I am your beloved. I'm going to pray in the Holy Ghost today, and I'm going to build up myself on my most holy faith. If you ever get too sophisticated or too <coughs> offended with God to confess his word, then that's when you're in trouble. Look, look at what uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3. He was talking to him. He said, you, however, continue in the things you have learned and can become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them. And that from childhood, you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through the faith which is in Jesus. At what age should Timothy cease to be impressed by the promises of God? Is it easy? Have you ever had the devil say, yeah, but you've been, you've, we can't, I don't know if I'm making this across. We want something new. America's love new. You put new on anything and they sell twice as many. That's why half the things in the grocery stay new and improved, okay? We always want something new, something fresh. 
But I want you to know that this word is new and fresh and alive with power. You yes. say, why do I need to confess it? Because when you confess the word of the living God, by his stripes, I am healed. Yes, I am. You are not just saying something you believe. You're releasing power. When, when Jesus, you saw the sword, and it, it, you are releasing the power of God to change your circumstances. You're glorifying him by saying, I know that you brought me this far in triumph, and you will continue to lead me in triumph. Yes. Hallelujah. Are the scriptures less precious to us because we've known them since kids? No. I mean, I, this is for the kids and all of us. It's really, I, the Lord's been dealing with me about this. And he said, I said, but I confessed that 30 years ago. I was confessing that. So I got my confession list out for 30 years and said, Lord, make it fresh and new. Uh, are you following me? We should never let familiarity with the word of God cloud our perspective to how precious and powerful and life-changing God's promises are. That, those, that word is the rock of our existence. Now, if you will go to Nehemiah, I just want to spend a little bit of time here. We, we are talking about what do you do when an attack comes, especially a surprise attack. We're going to go to Nehemiah 2 to start out with. And in case you missed any of it, or just to review, you hold steady, you call on God, you realize he's, he's waiting to see you through. I want to hit one more thing before we read Nehemiah. Nehemiah talks about how you set up a defense. The fourth thing I want you to think about is that you don't get offended that the just shall live by faith. Have you ever fought a lot of good battles and all of a sudden you just said, I'm tired of fighting? I don't. The Lord's not the cause of this warfare, okay? All right. I guess I made that point. How many of you know a scripture? Tell me your favorite scripture. Three people. I was going to do this just to put you on. Colleen. Didn't you raise your hand? What did you, what's your favorite scripture? You'll think of one. Carol. 2 Corinthians 2, 14. Um, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph and through us spreads the um, fragrance of um, his son, Jesus Christ. I forgot the second part that I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Amen. Amen. Casey, what's your favorite scripture? I like um, Acts 3, 26. For you first God raised up a servant and sent him isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Praise God. There's life. So my point is, don't ever think, well, I've been doing this a long time, I don't do it anymore. As long as you want life and power flowing out of you to arrange your circumstances, you say, thanks, thanks be to God that he is the God who accomplishes all things for me. Yeah. Now, I want to give you number five, and that is that when the enemy attacks, there are times when you have to mount a defense. And I don't know how well you're familiar with the book of Nehemiah. Here, here you go. You know how David founded, or Saul founded the kingdom, and then David, they served God for about a generation and a half, actually less. Then they started serving idols. I'm, I'm trying to tell you the whole Testament so it makes sense to you. 60 seconds. They got worse and worse and worse. Do you know that King Solomon that built the beautiful temple ended up marrying so many wives that he put sun gods and altars to the sun and blasphemous idols right in the temple courtyard? Can you fathom that reading? In, it's in First Kings. Unbelievable. They just didn't serve God. And so after a while, they got so far from God that he had to remove his hand. And a Babylonian king named Nebuchadnezzar burned down the temple and destroyed Jerusalem. It's about 600 B.C. Jeremiah prophesied that after 70 years, they'd go back. So a lot of them spent those 70 years in the capital city of Susa, which is the capital of Persia. They were slaves there. They were servants. Well, Nehemiah was one of those that got exalted. You know some of them. Daniel was a captain, all right? He stood right before Nebuchadnezzar. Esther married one of the Persian kings, Xerxes. Well, Nehemiah was one of these Jewish people that got really exalted, and he was the cupbearer to the king. And if we had time, we'd read the first and second chapter. But in the first chapter, he had people come to him from Jerusalem, and he said, how are things back home? And they began to cry, and they said, they're just awful. The, the wall is broken down. The city's destroyed. It's just absolute total ruins. And he said, he just sat down and cried and fasted and said, God, what do we do? Now remember, we've got a word through Jeremiah that after 70 years, they go back and rebuild. So he goes into the king's presence, and one of his jobs is to be happy, and he's not happy. And the king said, what are you so sad about? And the Bible says, I was very afraid. Well, the reason it's afraid is one of his jobs, not just to taste everything that is not poison, but to keep the king in a good mood. 
So I'm trying to condense this. The king said, what's the matter? He said, my hometown's in ruins. And he said, what do you want? He said, I want to go back and rebuild it. And I said, that sounds good to me. And the king, queen said, it was amazing. Isn't that amazing? They're the ones that destroyed it. And the king says, well, that sounds good to me. He says, what do you, how long do you need? And he told him. He said, what do you need? And he said, well, we need letters to the forest keepers out there. Because we don't have hardly any wood there. He said, we'll give you that. And so they go back. And it's just amazing that they find people with a heart. And so the first thing they do is they say, we can't live without defenses, so we're going to rebuild the wall. Just to plug us into the story, look at Nehemiah 2.17. Nehemiah is speaking to the people of Jerusalem. He said, then I said to them, you see the bad situation we're in? That Jerusalem is desolate and its gates burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. And I told them, how the hand of the Lord my God had been favorable to me, and about the king's words which he had spoken. And they said, let us arise and build. And so they put their hands to the good work. Well, that's cool, huh? But now in verse 19, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard it, they mocked us and said, what is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And so I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven will give us success, therefore we his servants will arise and build that you have no portion, right, or memorial. Why did we read that part? We see that here they have an absolutely hopeless situation. They have a handful of people left to rebuild. And they say, yes, they're all excited. And what did the, what did the, the enemies of the Lord Amen. immediately do? Well, bad idea. Okay. Third chapter, I wish we had time to read it. When we were coming into this building, we actually read it. The entire thing is like a chronology. But instead of being chronicles, it is families and the little part, every family would take like from here to over the wall, we'll build this part of the wall. And in this cool, just to plug in, let's read about four verses here. Nehemiah 3.17. They're, they're telling where everybody's building. After him, the Levites carried out repairs under Rehob and I. Next to him, Hashbashiah, the official of half the district of Caleb, carried out repairs for his district. And after him, their brothers carried out repairs under Babai, the son of Hanadad. I have no idea how to pronounce these. Official of the other half of the district. Two more verses. Next to him, Ezer, the son of Jeshua, the official of Mizpah, repaired another section in front of the son of the armory. And after him, Baruch, the son of Zabai, zealously repaired another section from the angle to the doorway to the house of Elisha, the priest. Okay, yeah. we can keep going. We read this whole thing when we were trying to get in this building. And then we, we held a big, remember we got in a big circle and prayed because the truth of the matter is, when you're at war, everybody's got a section, okay? Now, all this was doing very well, and if you could read this part, it says that they were having amazing success. Isn't this yeah. exciting? Guess what? The amazing success didn't stay exciting because the devil didn't like it. All right, so let's, we are going to read chapter 4. We've got 10 minutes. We can read it. It's only 23 verses. Nehemiah 4. Now what happened? It came about that when Sandown heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry and mocked the Jews. Would this be the devil? Yes. And he spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish it in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burned ones? So what happens when you take on a great project for God? You start with amazing success, but almost inevitably, somebody sticks his tongue out to you, right? Okay, verse 3. Now Tobiah the Ammonite was standing near him, and he said, well, what they're building, if a fox jumped on it, he'd break down their stone wall. Hear, O oh our God, how we are despised. Return their reproach upon their heads and give them up for plunder in a land of captivity. Look at verse 6. So we built the wall, and the whole wall was joined together half its height for the people had a mind to work. That's amazing. You know how long it normally takes to build a wall around the city? It takes a couple of years. You know, how well, you would plan a couple of years, three years to build a wall. They got it to half the height. In just a very few days. We're going to see in a little bit. They did the entire wall in 52 days. And you say, Pastor, what in the world is the application to this? When we decided to build this building, it was like all hell broke loose. I'm not glorifying the devil. It's just, okay. Even when we started the bus ministry, it took supernatural prayer, fasting, and believing for all of us to stay on the same page until things started working out. But you know why? Because we were not 
defensive, we were offensive. When these people came back from Babylon, they weren't trying to just defend their turf, they were trying to take turf back. When we go into Choppas and say, oh, we want to help you with the gospel. We love you. We just want to give you the word and help this word. to." We aren't just being defensive and to say, hold on to Colonial Beach. We have decided to extend the kingdom of God and help them extend the kingdom of God. And this is why you'll relate to the rest of the story. We're going to keep reading. Verse 7. Now, when Sandal and Tobiah, the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites, further the repair of the walls of Jerusalem went on, and that the breaches began to be enclosed, they were very angry. Now, what does that mean? We're not really talking flesh and blood here. The devil hates it, you know, when you start taking his turf. All of them conspired together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause a disturbance. So, what did the enemies of the Lord want to do when there's a powerful work going on? They want to cause a disturbance, right? Verse 9. But we prayed to our God, and because of them, we set up a guard against them, day and night. Now, which part of the day did they let their guard down? Not any. You said, are you going somewhere? Yeah, I think we're going to. I think those of us who are here are going to have to support those who are going with more prayer and fasting. Even if they don't do the fasting, we're going to, we have got to really step up to the plate. I've had more emails about this week than any week that I can remember. And the emails are from me prayer, okay? It's just been, you know, things blindsiding us. And it's not going to, it's not going to kill the church. It's not going to kill us. No. But you know what? I, there comes a point when you say, okay, enough's enough. Yeah. And, okay. Amen. So look at 9 again. It says, we pray to our God, and because of them we set up a guard against them, day and night. Verse 11. Our enemies said they will know or see until we come among them and kill them and put a stop to the work. So what is the devil's plan? Stop it. When the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times, can you read it ten times, they will come up against us from every place where you turn. Then I stationed men in the lowest parts, at the most vulnerable parts of the space behind the wall, the exposed places, and I stationed the people in families with their swords, spears, and bows. Pause. None of us have any literal uh, meat in my book. Most of us don't have sore spears and bows hanging around. But we do have the blood of Jesus and we have the name of Jesus. And we have complete agreement in this church. We're for, where we say, okay, we plead the blood over the campaign in Chaucus and everybody while they're there and while they're setting up. And we plead the blood of Jesus over this congregation. The, the attacks stop now. Yeah. Yeah. But verse from beyond. Verse 14, when I saw their fear, I rose and spoke to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, and I said, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. And when our enemies heard that it was known to us, and that God had frustrated their plan, does God know how to frustrate Satan? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Then all of us returned to the wall, each one to their works. Now the question is, do they put their weapons back in storage? Next verse. From that day on, half of my servants carried on the work, while half of them held the spears, the shields, the bows, the breastplates. And the captains were behind the whole house of Judah. So half of them worked, and half of them watched for the enemy. There's another wonderful passage when um, David, you know, had, um, what's the name of the town that was burned? Ziklag. They had 600 men, and 200 of them were not able to, were too temporary to go on. They stayed and guarded the stuff while they went out to battle the other 400. And when they came back, the 400 said, well, they don't get anything but their wives and their kids that we rescued. The stuff was ours. And David said, now, come on. They watched over our things while we were gone. Whoever stays with the stuff shares and shares alike with the one who goes to battle. And somehow we got to understand that everybody in the church, whether we're going to top us to help share the gospel or whether we're sending, we share and share alike in the rewards in the sight of God. And we share and we share alike in the prayer battles. Amen? Yeah. Verse 17. Those who were rebuilding the wall and those who carried the burdens took their load with one hand doing the work and the other holding a weapon. So what were they doing? They were basically laying bricks or rocks for that wall. So in one hand, you'd have a trowel and a rock, and the other hand, you held a sword. This is the perfect picture of the Christian life. You're always doing something positive for God, and at the same time, you're on the defense. As long, yeah. you know, as long as you live, you know? So, verse 18. 
As for the builders, each wore his sword, girded at his side, while the trumpeter stood near him. And I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we are separated from the walk from one another. At whatever place you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there, our God will fight for us. So we carried on the work, with half of them holding spears from dawn until the stars appeared. So they'd get up at the first light, and they wouldn't let anybody quit. Nobody quit until they could see stars. I bet those stars were pretty when they finally came out. Can you imagine how long day that was? At that time, I also said to the people, let each man with his servant spend the night within Jerusalem. A lot of them were from outside of town. They said, you stay right here, so that they may be a guard for us by night and a laborer by day. So neither I, my brothers, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us removed our clothes. We didn't get undressed at night. We stayed ready to fight 24-7. You say, you think that's fun? Probably not. But you know, there's certain times when you are in a season of warfare. And it's not that you're afraid or that you're glorifying the enemy, it's just that you realize, hey, th this, is, this is warfare. Now, that's the end of that chapter, but if you want to read the upshot, um, in Nehemiah 6.15, it tells the glorious victory of it. It says, so the wall was completed on the 25th of the month of Elul in 52 days. That's amazing. That's amazing. No big, heavy machinery, just people with the heart to work. You say, well, what do you think we should do? I really honestly believe that we need to have somebody fasting at least one meal a day and committed to pray 10 minutes in the spirit, five to 10 minutes in the spirit every single day from now until chocolate. I'm willing to take Fridays. I'm going to sign up for Fridays. But if we, I said, why does it matter? This really is war. If you were here Sunday night, unfortunately the devil's a real devil. Yeah. Now the wonderful part is, he is absolutely no match for the Word of God. He's no match for the name of Jesus or the blood. But what if these same people had had the favor of God and they said, well, we don't feel like carrying swords. The enemy would have gotten, you got to fight. And there's, okay. There's two scriptures I want to show you. Philippians 1, 29 to 30. And you say, nobody wants to fast. Nobody, you don't have to fast. If you don't have it on your heart to fast, you have to fast, okay? But how many of you can say, I can pray for five minutes, at least a couple times a week? I mean, just pray, this incessant prayer. We have so much power in our unity. Paul wrote to the Philippian church, and he said, For you, to you it has been granted, granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Experiencing the same conflict you saw in me and now for be in me. Now you say, wait a minute, I thought this church thought you didn't have to suffer with sickness. I don't believe he's talking about sickness at all. Okay? Why was Paul beaten with rods? Because he preached the gospel. Yeah. I'm not telling you you got to be beaten with rods. I'm asking you why Paul was. Okay. Why was he shipwrecked three times? Because he had... There are... Okay. Why did Jesus say, take up your cross and follow? He didn't say, take up your jacuzzi and follow. <laughs> he said, take up your cross and follow. Why? Yeah. Because there is an element of Christ's sufferings that we still fill up voluntarily, not because we aren't fine, we're on our way to heaven and our kids aren't fine, but because somebody else needs us. Look at this other scripture. We don't preach on it very much. Colossians 1.24. Paul said, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. He's not talking about sickness and disease. He's talking about getting stoned for the gospel because he preached. Amen? I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, watch this, I do my share on behalf of Christ's body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Now, what does that mean? When Jesus died on the cross, he suffered everything necessary for your salvation. And yet here it says in filling up what is lacking. What is lacking? Pastor Gordon always said this, and he said it over and over again. One of the things that's lacking is smiling at somebody who's been really, really snide and nasty to you. And you're just, you're, that's, yeah. are, you, are you hearing me? To pre the reason this church has survived is because a lot of the people who are really committed to it are committed to the to resist the unity of the Spirit and the bond of faith. That's in Ephesians 4 3. What does it mean to fill up when missionaries go to a tribe somewhere on earth that has never ever heard the gospel and they learn their language because they don't even have the Bible in their language and they give 20, 25 years of their life living without conveniences? They are. Um, filling up that which is lacking in Christ's affliction. Are you following me? There are certain things, I mean, 
You can get mad at me for saying it, but when we were starting the church, I'm not suffering now, but we were suffering for the sake of the gospel. And I'm not talking about living with less money, which we obviously very much did. I'm talking about people being nasty. I'm talking about just really hard to walk in love. I didn't even think I could walk in that much love. And your flesh suffers. Yeah. You, I mean, especially if you're as good at telling people off as I am, that's hard. <laughs> now listen. You say, what does it have to do with that? Well, we don't have to send 24 people to Chavez, Mexico. We can go to heaven without it. But Paul says, I feel like what is lacking. To you, can we back to the one in Philippians? I'll go in two minutes. For, for to you it is the bread of Christ that not only to believe in him, but also to do what? Suffer. Okay, now, I'm not believing that any of our missionaries who go down there are going to suffer. They're not going to end up in jail, they're not going to end up, okay? Amen. But trust me, it's going to be different living conditions. Yeah. Okay? For to you it has been granted to suffer. If we're not going, how do we suffer? We just set apart a little TV time and say, Lord, these people are beloved to me and the people hearing the word of your love. And for this half hour, I'm sacrificing that show to pray. And to, okay? You sacrifice a meal and you say, it's not a big deal. No, it's not a big deal, but it makes such a huge difference. Because honestly, if we were fighting and didn't have unity, it would be very hard to combat the devil. A while back, I mean, like a year or so ago, Gordon and I all said, well, and what? I was crazy. Yeah. I thought, this is not our heart. This is the devil. And some of us started that to pray and say, you found him in a good division. You can get off the church. And he did. And then we're just as happy as... You see, this is a demonic warfare. We're not fighting for us. How many of you know you're just as, as heaven bound as you could ever be? We are on our way to heaven. We're good. Mm -hmm. But to you also, it's been granted for Christ's sake to fill up for his last. Yeah. Does that make sense? So what did, what did Nehemiah do? He got, I'm going to get one more minute to draw, finish drawing the comparison, okay? Nehemiah, for a Jewish person in Susa, he had it made. He was the cupbearer to the king. He ate the king's food. Oh, well, he didn't get poisoned. He was real good. I mean, he ate it first. The king ate it second. He lived in the most comfortable room and palace in the place. He had no reason to make a long, excruciatingly difficult journey deal with Sam Ballot and Tobiah and all these nasty people. Why did he do it? Everybody see the purposes of God. The purposes of God will call you to get out of your comfort zone. But the awesome part is that if he had stayed in the palace, we would never have heard of him. Do you know why? Because he would have been as insignificant as many others. I don't like you, but I don't want to live in this. I want my life to be significant. Because he obeyed God, he became significant. Did it cost him something? Yeah. But praise God. They, they bought it through. How many of you be willing to at least commit to pray three times a week, five minutes at least, three times a week? And if you're, if you're Lord puts it on your heart to fast, let me tell you why. There are sign-up sheets by the um, light switches in the sound booth so that it's sort of a family is there. Just sign up. I believe God will honor us for covering them with prayer and fasting. Amen? Amen. Let's pray, John.